It has been a week of turmoil for global stock markets and banking stocks in particular. Silicon Valley Bank was the first to go belly up. Signature Bank and Silvergate followed suit. Even as investors try to digest this, shares of Credit Suisse, one of the largest lenders in Europe, tanked in trade. And this forced the Swiss National Bank to intervene with a $54 billion bailout. But this did little to calm frayed nerves. First Republic Bank in the United States needed a $30 billion bailout from a consortium of American banks, including heavyweights like Citi, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo and eight others. What can we expect next? Will more banks go belly up? What will be the impact on developing countries like India? To take this forward, we are joined by Kenneth Rogoff, economist and professor of economics at Harvard. Uh, Kenneth Rogoff, thank you very much for joining us. Let me straight off begin by asking you, about the Fed meet next week. Do you think that the Fed will go for a 50 basis point hike or a 25 basis point hike, or should there be a pause? Well, they're not gonna go for a 50 basis point hike. Uh, the optics of bailing out the rich depositors at Silicon Valley Bank, and in fact, the broader program they did for other big uh, uninsured depositors. And then at the same time, raising the interest rate 50 basis points, that alone, which hits Main Street, that alone is probably a reason they won't do it. It's probably more likely than not they will do half of that. Uh, I, and, you know, it all depends on what happens the next few days, couple days of next week. If the banking stocks seem calmish, then I for sure they're going to do the hike. If we're taking another leg down and there are more problems, they'll pause. Right. So you, it all depends on the stress in the banking sector. Uh, Mr. Rogoff, do you foresee more accidents in the U.S. banking sector? We've seen what has happened with a slew of banks. And now First Republic Bank, uh, many uh, banks in the U.S. have come to rescue First Republic. But do you think there could be more such accidents? Well, I mean, it's one thing to question if we're going to have panics where the depositors are all going to be trying to pull out their money. I think the Federal Reserve has made clear in the Treasury they will bend over backwards not to have panic liquidations of banks. On the other hand, uh, interest rates have gone way up, and that hits a lot of banks where might go into a recession. That's going to hit them a lot more. So if we're talking about banking stocks, it's easy to imagine that they could go way down. I, I see the problems as worldwide. We've seen this remarkable rise in interest rates. And frankly, I think it was inevitable because we had these ultra low interest rates that prevailed after the global financial crisis. And it probably wasn't going to last forever. And so there are adjustments to be made. And it, I, I expect to see many more problems pop up before this is over. All right. Uh, you're seeing uh, many more problems. Could you describe the kind of stress we may be in for? Uh, many have said that this is a repeat of the Lehman Brothers moment. Do you, do you see similarities between what happened in 2008 to today? Well, the, at least the authorities are going to bend over backwards not to do an exact repeat of Lehman. They may make a different mistakes, but they're trying not to repeat that one. To have a bank blow up that's so interconnected, it brings down and freezes a lot of the financial system with it. Credit Suisse, quite frankly, had the possibility of doing that. But I, I, I clear that they're going to take what actions are necessary. They're probably going to break it up at the end of the day. Uh, I, I think mm -hmm. it's stock must be down 95% from the peak or something, uh, sell it into pieces. But that's very different than uh, simply you know, having it go bankrupt. On the other hand, there are many things that are worse than in 2008. We have inflation. Didn't have that then. Central banks can't really think about lowering interest rates. We have, of course, uh, war in Europe, which is uh, causing all sorts of problems in trade and further problems ahead. I believe that we're in an era of more normal interest rates, real and nominal, than we were. And that also makes things harder. We went through this period that I think was quite exceptional, where 
it was money was just free for governments, for the rich country governments, and suddenly it's not. Hmm. Hmm. Right. Uh, also, looking at uh, what the ECB did, announcing a further rate hike of 50 basis point, uh, clearly seeing inflation as a challenge. Do you see this putting more pressure on the banking sector? It certainly puts more pressure on the banking sector. I, I understand why they did what they did, although, frankly, I was surprised, given the stresses in European banks that we're continuing to see today. Uh, I think the message they wanted to send was, we're going to beat inflation. We think our banking system's just wonderful. You don't need to worry about it. And they were worried that if they paused, or raise rates less than they had planned to do a week ago, somehow would signal they know something. I mean, in fact, what brought Credit Suisse down so quickly is their major shareholder, Saudi Arabia, uh, didn't want to put in more money. And everybody wondered, why weren't they being given a really good deal? So I think the ECB thought that by raising interest rates, it was sending a positive signal. But uh, the fact is, the high interest rates are stress, and we'll see what's next. Right. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the challenges for the U.S. economy in the coming year, we've seen the U.S. Fed, the, uh, the, the Treasury Department, Janet Yellen, all of them going on to say that the U.S. banking system is resilient. Uh, they have rushed to protect the depositors of banks like SVB, Silvergate, uh, which have collapsed. But what are the other challenges do you foresee that could be coming up for... Uh, the U.S. economy in the weeks and months to come? First of all, uh, what is the Treasury Secretary supposed to say? You should panic. Go get your money as soon as possible. No, her job and the Fed's job is to try to tell people, no matter what the reality and the risks are, you know, don't rush to take your money out. Because, of course, if they all do that, then there'll certainly be a problem. Oh, I, I think, uh, first of all, I want to say the U.S. economy has done better than I would have thought. I think than most people thought. The labor market's still very strong. The consumer doesn't seem to quit. Initially, that was because there was all this money left over from the stimulus and from savings during COVID. Now they're going into debt. We still have a very strong consumer in the U.S., uh, and firms are still having trouble getting workers. That said, these interest rate hikes are going to start to kick in. They're long lags. We don't know exactly how long. And so at some point, we are going to see a lot more tensions. It's hard to know. It might not be till 2024. I don't think there's any way to get rid of the inflation that the U.S. has to get it down from, say, three and a half, uh, three to four percent and bring it down to two or two and a half percent. I don't think there's any way to do that without having a recession. And so what I think the Fed's going to do is say, well, we're going to take it slow and they're going to leave inflation up. And then maybe in that case, there won't be a recession. But I, I, it's very hard to know what's going on now. The pandemic has distorted markets labor market, uh, supply chains, half uh, our office buildings in the United States are still empty half the time. It is hard to read for everyone. And so far, the U.S. is surprised on the upside, but that doesn't mean there aren't more surprises on the, ahead that could be in the other direction. Right. The SVB Financial Group the, uh, the parent body of uh, the Silicon Valley Bank has filed for bankruptcy protection. Uh, what kind of trajectory could this take in the days to come? Uh, what immediate and uh, medium-term ramifications do you see? Well, I think the really big issue is there are two sides to the bank. There's the deposits, and they protected the depositors and, frankly, overprotected them. Would have been nice to see some of the big depositors get what we call a haircut. But at the same time, the bank, this was a bank that was lending to the most innovative sector in the United States. Half of the tech sector was doing at least some business with Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank was making loans to startups that the big banks didn't want to do. Losing that, that's a huge thing. 
uh, it's you know being acquired, but you know exactly what that'll do, we don't know. I think that's what really concerns me. I think there's also going to be huge political fallout from this, not simply from the fact that they bailed out the rich depositors, some with billions in deposits. They only insure you know, $250,000. I, I think there are going to be a lot of questions about why didn't they see this? This was not a huge bank, but it was the 16th largest bank or something like that. It was under the supervision of the San Francisco Federal Reserve. I'm sure that the, San, the uh, supervisors could tell us what the carbon footprint uh, uh, was of Silicon Valley Bank, but you know what was going on with their books. Uh, and then I think there are also concerns being raised about why, when it was clear that there was some kind of run, and at that point, the bank was probably still solvent. Why didn't the Federal Reserve step in earlier to provide liquidity to at least calm things down and have a more orderly change. There's a lot of stories. We'll be continuing about this in the weeks to come. Right. Just to ask you about the SVB uh, uh, bank once again. SVB's uh, UK assets were sold to HSBC for one pound, and they did not opt for a bailout like US. Which out of the two approaches, according to you, is better? It's far better to sell the bank than to do the bailout. It is far better. Silicon Valley is a very bank, is a very valuable enterprise. And I, I, was, I was just puzzled that they didn't find someone to sell it to uh, earlier on. That, that's the first thing you do in a crisis like this, is you try to wipe out the stockholders, the shareholders, but then you know keep it going as a going concern. Uh, I think the post-mortem on Lehman in 2008 was they should have sweetened the deal for somebody to make that happen. I don't know why it didn't. Again, I only read rumors, but the rumors mm -hmm. and the press are that the Treasury and the Federal Reserve had a buyer that they liked, but the there's a third body, the mm -hmm. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, that has to also approve, and for some reason they didn't. We just don't know. Right. Uh, Mr. Rogoff, what we've seen now over the last two weeks with four to five banks, do you think uh, this is the last of the contagion or will this contagion continue? Financial crises like this go in waves. And I do think it will continue at some point, but maybe not in the United States, maybe not in Switzerland, maybe not even in Europe. It's the real underlying problem is that interest rates, inflation-adjusted interest rates, have gone up. And in my opinion, which used to be contrarian, but I think has now become much more widely accepted, they are probably going to be high this decade. That adjusts the prices of a lot of assets. It means a lot of institutions are carrying loans on their books that weren't, you know, value, that are overvalued. Now, there are a lot of institutions that aren't so regulated, we call the shadow banking system. And I think, you know, you have some of this also in India. And they are probably holding a lot mm. of problems as well. Uh, but that is yet to come. Mm. Right. Uh, what kind of stress do you expect for the Indian banking sector and the Indian economy as a result of what's happening in the United States, what's happening in Europe and with the global economy? Well, India is starting from a much better position. I mean, India was basically the fastest growing large economy in the world. Uh, it has benefited from uh, ch uh, people not wanting to invest in China. Firms, they're not leaving China, but they're looking other places. And I think India has been benefiting from this a lot and probably will continue to. So uh, certainly starting from a stronger position, that alone has to help India. On the other hand, uh, okay, I'm not an expert on this, but the banking sector in India has ve a very long history of troubles. There have been new uh, initiatives passed to try to deal with this, but we've seen this movie before. So um, the, I think the problem in India is not so much 
the meltdown in the banking sector is you want a healthy banking sector to make loans to keep the economy moving. Uh, that could be a struggle. But I mean, essentially, if the global economy goes into recession, uh, India is not as open as uh, China, but of course that would be painful. Right. Uh, my final question about uh, Credit Suisse, you have referred to it earlier as well. Credit Suisse has declared material weaknesses related to financial reporting, even though the Switzerland Central Bank has given $54 billion liquidity as a lifeline to Credit Suisse. What could be the potential impact of uh, this development on stock markets across the world, on investor sentiment? Well, I think they're trying to uh, ring fence Credit Suisse and my expectations that it's going to get broken up, but in an orderly way that hopefully won't cause a lot of problems. But I mean, the, the, the trouble is Credit Suisse has long been the problem child, not just of the Swiss banking sector, but the European banking sector. They almost fell in 2008. They've had all sorts of scandals. They've been thinking about breaking it up for a long time. This is no shocker that Credit Suisse uh, had continuing problems. The trouble is, is what pushed it over the top, some of the things that made it worse were clearly this high interest rate environment that hurts everyone. And lastly, if we're talking about European banking, the war in Ukraine, uh, you know, there are problems ahead there. I don't think there's any question. Yes, they did a lot of uh, strong regulation after 2008. Will it be enough? Right. Uh, and my final question, uh, how close are we to recession? And what is the one big thing that all major countries, all economies need to do in order to prevent a Lehman Brothers moment? Well, the second question is actually easier than the first question, which is, I think, uh, you need to stay on top of supervision to be able to make a judgment uh, when you need to bail the banks out. I, I don't think there's any question that the authorities this time are tilting more towards when in doubt, bail it out. That's what they did. But uh, that could cause long-term problems. We just don't know. I mean, in terms of how close we are to a recession, um, just a couple weeks ago, the IMF, uh, at the end of January, the International Monetary Fund was saying things are much better than we thought. The global economy is looking really good. I think when we see their report in April, they're going to be much more cautious. The odds of a global recession are far from certain, but they've gone way up. Right. Uh, Kenneth Rogoff, thank you so much for joining us here on CNBC thank TV you. 18 on Global Eye, talking about uh, the possibility of uh, a global recession and uh, more stress in the banking sector in the US and in the European Union. Thank you once again for being with us. We're going to take a break, but uh, when we return, the International Labour Organization's report on world employment highlights discrepancies between the value of work and the working conditions of key and essential workers. A special discussion with Jinayan Berg, senior economist at the ILO, after a break. Welcome back. You're watching Global Eye. The International Labour Organization has released a report on world employment and social outlook for the year 2023. The report dives into understanding the value of essential workers and analyzes the working conditions of these workers. Those that fall under eight main occupational groups such as health, food systems, security, among others, qualify as key workers. The findings from the report highlight a significant discrepancy between the value of work and the working conditions of key workers. The main uh, findings from the report show that key workers are at an increased risk of occupational safety and health. They are heavily reliant on temporary jobs and are subject to long, irregular work hours as well as low pay. The report calls for invest investing in essential services, including investments in improving the working conditions of those who perform critical work. Let me uh, now go across to Janine Berg, Senior Economist at uh, the International Labour Organization. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, give us a sense of the kind of challenges, the risks, and the, the pay inequalities when it comes to key and essential workers across the world, and which are the economies where these inequalities, where these risks are the most glaring? 
Okay, well, thank you for having me. So we see um, amongst the key workers, we see problems in working conditions um, among all the groups. And this is actually something that's not just specific to poorer countries. We see the same problems also in richer countries. Um, there are differences amongst the poor countries and the richer countries in terms of which are the occupations that are most prominent in key work. So for example, uh, in, in higher income countries, one out of every five key workers is in healthcare, whereas in lower income countries, uh, it's just one out of every 50 workers are in healthcare. And most of, of, the, of the key workers in, 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 in poor countries are in agriculture. So we have problems that are specific to those occupations. So in agriculture, for example, uh, there tends to be very low pay. There's often uh, some national regulations exclude agricultural workers from, from some of the labor protections. Many are also self-employed. They don't have access to social protection. Uh, there's occupational safety and health risks and the work that they do, either exposure to pesticides, for example, uh, exposure to sun, all of those issues. Uh, in the other occupations, we have uh, an, another range of lists. But what we saw in the pandemic um, is that there, well, of course, and we know this, there, because these people had to leave the safety of their homes to go to work, to provide these goods and services that all of us rely upon, they were more exposed to getting uh, ill. And so we found in the analysis that we did of mortality, for example, that key workers had a higher mortality rates than non-key workers. Um, and then amongst them that we see, for example, transport workers were the group that had the highest rates of mortality. Right. Now, speaking about India, uh, any particular risk groups among the eight categories that you identified in India? Your report speaks about the health hazards for rickshaw pullers, app-based taxi drivers. Yes. So um, there's certainly, um, I mentioned agricultural workers, and that, that of course, is a very prominent occupa occupation in, in India. But then you have food vendors. Food vendors, uh, many of them are self-employed. They work long hours. They don't have uh, social protection. Transport workers in general. So those could be the rickshaw pullers. There could be uh, taxi drivers. Um, those occupations in, in, in general don't have very good protections. Um, and they were also more exposed to risk during the pandemic. Um, there's also security workers who faced, uh, uh, violence and harassment. Um, we saw during, during the pandemic, elevated levels of verbal abuse, threats, physical assaults, uh, that could have been directed at, at, at different categories of workers, but were very prominent amongst health workers, amongst food vendors, um, and amongst uh, security workers. Um, in the category of health workers, the, the report looks at the situation of the ASHAs in India, the community health workers, uh, first of all, for the important role that they played during the pandemic in providing services, providing vaccines, um, informing people about how to take care of themselves um, uh, during the pandemic. But then we also see that there's also some deficiencies in their working conditions because many of these, because these workers are not considered uh, employees um, and they don't have, as a result, they don't have all of the labor and social protections that would come with um, being classified as an employee. Right. Uh how do salaries and health facilities for key and essential workers in India compare to those in other parts of the world? Yeah, so um, health facilities, I mean, all over the world, there's problems with underinvestment in health. Um, and this is this is a widespread issue. The WHO has announced that there's a global shortage of nurses across the world. And this, of course, has repercussions on people's on working conditions in the hospitals. Uh, so if you're a nurse and there's an understaffing of nurses, then that means that you're going to have more work, higher work intensity. You're going to have to probably work more overtime. Um, and so all of this results in in excessive work, long hours, which then has can lead to burnout. And we saw during the pandemic that there were high levels of burnout. Um, and of course, that means that 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 contributes to the to the, the ongoing problem that we're seeing across the world of labor shortages in health. Um, in the health sector as well, uh, we see a lot of uh, subcontracting and agency work, uh, which in principle could be fine. But what happens often is that people are I mean, they might be working shoulder to shoulder, but they have different contractual arrangements and not the same rights and benefits as people that would have. Uh, more permanent contracts. Um, so this is something that you know we recommend that you know one can have flexibility right. in contractual arrangements, but we want to make sure that these contractual arrangements give the same rights and benefits to workers, so that the 
flexibility of those counter-tactual arrangements is used because of the flexibility, but not as a means to, to lower pay, to lower working conditions. All right, uh, Janine, uh, we've run out of time, but thank you so much for joining us with uh, the ILO's outlook for uh, the working conditions of key and essential workers and what are some of the interventions that we need in order to improve their conditions and thereby increase their productivity as well. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Global Eye. Don't go anywhere. News continues on CNBC TV 18.